Adding in some sort of projectile requires us to create a projectile first. So we need a new symbol. And this time we are going to select the advanced tab when you do it because the symbol, when we work with it, we're going to be adding it to our project dynamically through code. It's not going to exist on the timeline. We will be putting it there through programming. So we do that by giving it a name. I'm calling mine projectile. And then I click the export for action script button. And once I do that, and then hit OK. It gives me a message, a definition for this class could not be found, blah, 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 blah. And I can say, OK, I'm good with that. And now if I notice in my library, I'm now in this new empty symbol. And it has an action script linkage. The same way that we dynamically attached music to our project, previously we're going to attach this projectile object to our project by its action script linkage name. So now I need to make something. And projectiles typically work best when they're reasonably small. If you make them really, really big, it requires a lot more precision and finesse of how and where and when you make it show up on screen so that it creates a convincing animation. If you keep it small, it's much easier to make it seem more realistic when it shows up on screen. So once I have created my projectile object, in this case I just did a little green line, I have it reasonably centered on the registration for the symbol, I am good to go. So the linkage name will always begin, not always, but by convention will always begin with a capital letter. And it's tradition that it follows the name of the sim, the library name of the symbol. And then we can refer to that object in our main project. Now going back to the code that's part of the project, if we want to see this object show up on screen, we can do it simply by asking for it to come to life. I'm going to just comment out the music here so we don't keep hearing that. And now if I want this missile, this projectile, to show up on screen, then what we can do is just create the variable object for it. So first we're going to make one, prove that we can pull it from the library and make it show up on screen. Once we do that, we'll undo that, and then we'll make it so that we can push a key on the keyboard, which will then launch or fire a copy of that missile object. So I'm creating a variable object here, calling it projectile. And this projectile will be of object type projectile with a capital P and set it equal to a new projectile. So this says, my variable object, which is of the type that it's linking to the thing in my library, is a new projectile. And technically that object's a movie clip, so we could say it's type movie clip, but I think this just keeps it a little cleaner this way. Just You have to watch your capitalization for it to occur. So this now says, I want to see that object exists. It doesn't make the object actually show up on screen though. To make the object show up on screen, what we have to do is issue a command, add child, and add child says add this object to what's referred to as the display list. The display list is the list of objects that we are currently able to see on the stage. And add child says add this to the main root movie display list. Now this will put the object at position zero, zero. So if I wanted this object to be not up in the top left corner, 
We could say projectile x equal to, I'll just give it random numbers of 100 and 100. So if I set its x and y equal to 100, when I run my movie, we create a projectile object, pulling it from the library, putting it into memory. We add it to the stage using add child. And then are setting its x and y properties. And if I look, we will see the projectile is now existing at 100 and 100 on screen. So if proven now, we can get it to show up on screen. It's not doing much yet, but this is the first step. So now that we've proven we can do it, we're not really going to need any of this code. We may revisit it and modify it a little bit later. Um, I'm just going to comment it out so it's not in my way. Now on to the proper code. What we first are going to want to do is to verify when we push a key to fire and we could refer to the key that we're pressing or we could just refer to it as if we're shooting something or firing off a weapon we could use the word fire so that's what I'm going to use and in the same way that we have a left and a right we're now going to have a fire this is going to be we're firing or we're not firing so we'll have a boolean that will be setting when we press whatever key we wish to assign to it. I will be using space. You, If you want to use other keys, you're welcome to use those as well. So we started out by saying we are not firing. And after we've done that, we go into our keyboard code. The key is pressed, key is released. And we're going to use the same kind of logic that we had before. So. I'm going to do some copy pasting. And the space key corresponds to 32. So the key code for space is 32. So if you want to do it that way. So space is 32. If you wanted to use shift, it's 16. Uh, if you wanted to use the up arrow, it's uh, 38. If you want to use the down arrow, it's 40. And those are the only ones I have memorized at the moment. You can go find the rest if you're so inclined. Uh, you can write a key code logger and just log it out, or you could uh, go hop online and go look for it. Uh, and the key codes aren't flash specific, so they're numbers that are generated by the keyboard. So any program that you're writing that is accessing the keyboard in any language is going to use the same key codes. So in the same way that we have uh, it's a good idea because we sometimes are going to um, but currently we don't need to necessarily track space with it under the key released because we will be setting fire equal to false a little bit differently in taking care of it that way. Um, now we'll, we'll leave it. Um, change my mind. I'll leave it. So currently we press the key fires true like or the key fires false. Now we have to figure out how to deal with firing. Now if we only had one item that we could fire. So we could only fire, say, one bullet at a time or one missile at a time. We could then track that single object. But most people find they like to have a, an ability to fire more than one object at a time. So you can do it more machine gun style, so you have a higher fire rate. And if that's the case, that's what we're going to do. And then that requires us to use the timer object that we looked at last week. So we'll be using the timer object as well here. So we'll have a firing timer that we put into play. So currently I could run my project and 
nothing happens because it's really not doing anything. One thing that we're going to want to be able to do is to have more than one, um, be able to track more than one projectile. And we do that by using an array. And remember, when you see code hinting show up, if you type the next key that you need, it automatically completes with whatever's highlighted. If you just uh, hit uh, tab or return, it selects what's ever high right, highlighted and puts it in for you. So then that can speed up your coding dramatically so you don't have to type things out in gory detail. So you can use the code hinting if it helps you. So what we're going to be able to do is to use this array of op to store our projectiles. Now this is going to require us to talk a little bit about arrays, what arrays are, and how to access some of the methods of arrays. We're only going to be really using two methods of arrays. They're, we're not going to get super in-depth into what they are, but think of an array as an ordered list of objects or like a file drawer. You open up the file drawer in a desk and hanging in, the hanging files in the drawer are sequential. You have the first hanging file, then you have the next hanging file, the next hanging file, and that's what the array is, and each one of those hanging files holds an object in it. That's all an array is. It's a collection of objects that we can sequentially work our way through. So if I only have one projectile, my array has one object in it. If I have three projectiles on screen, I have three objects in my array. If I don't have any missiles on screen, I have no objects in my array. And we're able to then test against what's referred to as the length of the array. The length is how many objects are currently contained in it. So right now my array has a length of zero because I haven't put anything into it. But what I will do is when I fire, I will add an object to my array. Now that happens, and the original code that we made for our projectile, I'm going to now use that when I construct my object in my array. So I'm going to get that out of there, and we'll pull it up where I need it. So in my main loop, currently I have, if I, pre whoa, if I press right, it goes. If I press left, it goes. Then it does a bunch of stuff moving around the world, and la -dee da what I'm going to do is just collapse that code because we don't, I don't need to see that on screen right now. I'm just going to do this so that I have a little bit more room. So I'm inside the main draw function at the end of it. And what we can do is just simply say if fire is true. So if fire is true, Then we can, down here, that code that I had from above, I'm go over. So I'm going to make a new projectile. We can add that projectile to the screen. And then, We need to figure out where to put that projectile on screen so that it starts at the correct location. So we'll move it to wherever the player is. Oh, sorry. Let me just retype that correctly. Projectile X is equal to player X. Player X. projectile y is equal to the player's y. So we set it to wherever the player is. So this now, if I fire, this creates a new projectile, adds it to the screen, and sets it to wherever, whatever location the player is at. And in the interest of verifying 
along the way that steps are working, this would be a good chance to go. So I hit the space bar and boom, it shows up. So we can see it's working. Now my projectile is not moving yet. It's not moving because I have not put in any instructions on how to move it. So what we need to be able to do is to make that projectile move each frame and update its position. And this is where it gets to be a little bit more interesting. So if we hit fire, then we move the projectile. And then what we need to do is we need to then or we add the projectile. And then after one's been added, we need to move it. It's in the same kind of token that if I press keys, we are now moving the world by speed x, moving the obstacles by speed x. So we're doing all of these changes in position. We're modifying their values. We're going to do a similar operation to our projectiles. And just Minimize these again. So currently it adds the projectile, but the projectile doesn't get to move. Now an easy thing would be if I could, now this won't work, I'm just going to type in some bad fake code that won't work, but if this did work, I could say if the projectile's x is less than the width of the stage, then so we could, you know, modify its x position by a certain amount. So we're moving it down the screen. So that would be one thing we could do. But the problem that we will run into is this name of projectile we no longer have access to once I leave this curly brace. This is uh, issue of in the world of programming it's referred to as variable scope. And if you notice these variables, we define them at the main level of our project. This variable is defined inside a set of curly braces. So what that means is I only have access to that variable inside those curly braces. That's how it works. So you're able to limit the reach or ability of accessing variables. Otherwise, what would happen in programming is we would have an unlimited number of variables that we would need if we couldn't encapsulate them or we'd have to have so many differing names for everything that your brain would just go insane. So we, we don't want that to happen. And this is where that array is going to come in to use. So projectiles is the name of our array. And what we have is we have an option. We Now, because it knows what kind of object projectiles is, you'll notice these are all the methods that we have access to as part of an array. And as I said, we're only going to be accessing, uh, I guess, three properties of our array this evening, length, and then we will be using push and we will be using splice. So we'll look at each of those. What push does is it takes and adds something to the array. So then I can just simply say I want to stick my projectile into my array. So that now adds it to my array. So that will kind of make do with this code later, but uh, that's not real code. So this now puts the object in the array. And what I'm going to do is 
every, every time we let go of uh, the space key, I'm just going to send myself a message so we can verify this is working before we try and do more. So I'm going to just have it print out a number of how many projectiles are in my array. So if I run this, now you'll notice the numbers are going up because it's adding one every frame that I have the spacebar pressed down. So if I press quickly, I get one. But if I press and hold, it's doing 24 per second. So if I hold for a second, I'm getting 24. So it, that's how many projectiles it's currently constructed. So during that quick demonstration, I just created 95 little green dots on screen. We can't see them all, but it did create them. I'm going to modify the code slightly just so we can prove, because sometimes people need a little bit of uh, proof that things are happening. So every time I press the key it's just adding a new one at some random Y position so we can see how it's progressively filling them up on screen. So it truly is. Now there's 150 of them that have landed on screen. So it is adding and adding and adding those objects on screen. Don't need to trace that anymore. The next thing that we need to do is we need to use an additional programming construct where we are going to be able to iterate or loop through all of the objects inside projectiles. And we accomplish that through a for loop. And okay, I'm just going to get rid of that so it's not bugging me. And when we're doing a for loop, a for loop follows a certain syntax. And for loops either start at the end and count down or start at the beginning and count up. For what we're doing, it actually works best to start at the end and count down. So if you've used for loops in any programming before and you always count it up, this is now a chance to count down. So the way a for loop works is we define a variable i, and we will set that variable equal to the length of projectiles minus 1. And we are going to loop through projectiles while i is greater than or equal to 0. And then each time we loop, do this loop, we will take one away from i. So if I had 100 projectiles in my array, the first time through, i would be equal to the length of projectiles, 100, minus 1. That's 99. And 99 is greater than or equal to 0, so we'll loop through. At the end of the loop that's going, the instructions that will come inside these curly braces, then we take one away from i, so then it becomes 99. So it's like doing 99 bottles of beer on the wall, and we keep going. And once we get down so that i is then equal to 1, and we start out 1 at the very end, and then 1 minus 1 becomes 0. That works. And then we take 1 away again, becomes minus 1. Minus 1 is now no longer making this true, so it stops going. Oh, and I just lied. We don't start at 100. If, if we had 100 objects, we would actually start at 99 bottles of beer on the wall, or 99 projectiles on screen. So we start out at our initial value. But if I haven't fired anything yet, projectiles has a length of 0. 0 minus 1 is minus 1. Minus 1 is not greater than or equal to 0. So we don't even go through the loop. To access one of the objects in our projectiles, 
what we do is we use square bracket notation. So we use the square brackets and then I to refer to the place. So the way that you access an object in an array is you do it by its position. So think of it as you know, a bunch of school children who are all lined up to go to lunch. And the first child at the head of the line is in position zero. The next child is at position one. The next child is at position two. So if we have objects in our array, we access them by position number. That's what the I is going to fill in. So the first time through, if I have no objects in my array, we don't do this. If there's one object in my array, projectiles length one minus one gives me zero. So that one object in my array is at position zero. So we say projectile square bracket i dot x and then we can modify that. So currently I'm just going to send my projectile off to the right side of the screen so I will add an amount to it. So then that now moves it. So if I have a projectile it's going to start shooting off to the side of the screen. You can run it and we can see I'm now firing. So currently the objects we fire, they move 10 every frame and they'll keep going even when they're off the stage we can't see them. They're still moving off into imaginary space 10 pixels per frame. So as a good practice we probably want to get rid of them. And we can do that whoop, wrong key command there. But we can see the fire hose method, press the key, it fires a few at a time. So if we want to get rid of the object, we can say if the projectile at the current position, dot x, is greater than, and the way we can access the width of our movie is stage dot stage width so we can access so if the object's x is greater than the width of the stage then we can yank that object out of here and get rid of it and kick it out of the projectile array and we'll I'll be changing this number or this value to a smaller amount just so we can see that it's happening off screen or that it's disappearing a little bit easier in a moment. But first, the correct code would be Now, objects are not allowed to remove themselves. If we want to remove an object from screen, we have to have the object's parent do it. So we say object.parent.removeChild and then the object we're trying to remove. Annoying, but that's just how it is. Objects aren't allowed, they don't have enough authority to remove themselves, so they have to ask their parent to uh, yank them off of the screen. So that removes the object from the screen, and then we need to remove the object from our array. To remove an object from the array, we use the splice method. And then the splice method, we tell it what position we want to remove and how many objects we want to remove from the list. So what splice does is we, if we said at a certain position, we could remove one, two, three, five, ten objects if we just put a different number in there. The i is, of course, the position in the array, and then the 1 is how many objects. I was doing some code once and put in 0 instead of 1, and I couldn't figure out why my objects weren't being spliced out of my array. So I'm like, where are, why aren't they going away? I can't figure it out because I put in 0, not 1. So this now removes the object from the array. So this is now good coding that 
We remove the object from the screen using remove child. So remove child is the opposite of add child. Add child adds it to the display list. Remove child removes it from the display list. And then splice kicks it out of the array. So as <coughs> promised, we are using three array properties this evening. Push, length, and splice. These are all methods of or properties of arrays. Push adds an object to the array. Length tells me how many objects are in the array. And splice allows me to remove an object from an array. Array methods are very similar in most of the common languages right now. So using push, using shift, using pop, using splice, these are all very common methods that we can use when we use the array object in whatever language you happen to be working in. And this is the detailed syntax that Flash is going to be happy with. So currently this allows me to now run my project and see, and I and we are not really seeing them go away. If I change that number to a smaller amount here, let's go 700. So we can see that they're disappearing at the 700 mark instead of the edge of the screen. So it's proving that they're going away. <coughs> now, some of you may be noticing that as it goes, that the object is starting in front of the player. So that's, you know, that's no good. So we're going to have to work with that a little bit. Now I'm also going to, if the player is here, if I fire, we can see it still goes backward. You know, so no matter where the player is, we're shooting in the same direction. So we have to address that. And it would be nice to address having the player on top of the um, projectiles. Now the way that display list works is every time we choose issue a statement of add child, it puts that object at the top of the display list. So if we just put in an add child player, that now automatically pulls the bug because it's the last thing in my draw function. That means the bug will be on top of everything else. So that allows me to keep it on top of what's there. So that's one solution. There may be others depending on what you need to work with or what your project entails, but that can be a pretty a basic solution. Now the next thing that would be nice is to control so that when I'm facing in one direction, he fires one way. When he's facing in the other direction, he can fire the other way. And then finally, we will take care of the fire hose effect and put a limit on his ability to fire so he's not firing so many in a row. Setting it up so that we can fire in more than one direction. What we need to do is we need to keep track of what direction we are facing. Uh, GHD. And I'm going to start out. So my artwork is set up currently. My player is facing to the right. So I'm going to set a Boolean facing right true. So when facing right is false, that means I must be pointing to the left. So then I know is my player facing left or facing right. So we're able to track this. It's possible, depending on how you've set up your project, that you could keep track of this in other ways. But this, when I was building the code sample, seemed to be a simple enough solution. So we're setting up this Boolean that when we're facing right, it's true. When we're facing left, it has a false value. So the next thing that we need to do is then to attach that to our movement for 
the object. So I'm going to go uncollapse some code here. So we can currently see, I mean, I guess I could check off of rotation Y, but some of you made artwork facing left and facing right, so that wouldn't work for yours. So at this point, then what we can do is when we move to the right, set facing right equal to true. And when I move to the left, so when I press the left key, if left is true, so this is the when I'm pressing left, and we can say facing right equals false. So I can be facing right or not facing right. Facing right is true or facing right is false. And then armed with that information, we can then modify how we animate the projectile. So when I press left, facing right becomes false. When I press right, facing right becomes <coughs> true. Once we know what direction we're facing, we know that when we're facing right, we want to modify the direction of movement in a positive value. And when we're facing left, we want to modify our projectile movement by a negative value. So we can do that with a simple if. If facing right is equal to true, We modify our position by a positive value, else we can modify it by a negative value. So instead of plus 10, we can subtract 10. So if I'm facing right, modify by 10. If we're facing left, modify by 10 in the opposite direction. So after realizing the error of my ways, what we need to do is we need to give our projectile that we are working with its own facing right property and set it equal to whatever facing right happens to be. So, in the same way that an object is allowed to have an X property and a Y property, objects are allowed to have any other properties we want to assign to them. That's one of the perks, joys of programming, is we can attach properties to objects. So objects have certain inherent characteristics or properties when they're created in Flash. They have an X, they have a Y, they have a scale, they have a rotation and things like that. But they can also have any other user assigned properties, properties that we assign to them. So we're saying this particular projectile, when it is created, will have a facing right property of whatever facing right was when we created it. And then just modify one tiny bit right there. So then we say if that object's facing right is true, it goes in this direction, otherwise it goes in that direction. If we're lucky this time, we can see it now keeps going and they keep going in their respective and appropriate directions.
adding the timer is going to be just like using the previous one. So in the interest of time, I'm going to copy, do some pasting, and I'm going to call this my firing timer. And I know I only want it to go one time. And I know that I want it to, um, if it's 1,000, that's one second. That's a really long time. We'll go for half a second. Um, based on experience, that seems to be a decent amount. And I should heed my own advice to copy paste since I apparently am struggling with typing there. So I have my firing timer that will go off after half a second. And I'll listen for it being done. And I'll call this reset firing. So now what we need to do is to have a firing value that gets set off and then it resets itself after we have fired. That's it. Now we're firing. It's enough for one night. <laughs>